I'm Helen Evans, the Mary and Michael Shaharis Curator for Byzantine Art at the Met, and we are very delighted to be having this lecture today at a time when many of us worry about the cultural of heritage of much of the region extending from Tunisia to Yemen. Um, I think it's very important to remember that there are many people there intensely interested about preserving their heritage and working very hard to do so. So it's Professor Nardi is one of those people invited to the Monastery of St. Catherine at Sinai to work on the great apse mosaic built in the sixth century, the instigation of the Emperor Justinian, and surviving today um, and now for another probably 1,500 years because of the work he and his team have done over the last few years at the request of his eminence, Archbishop Damianos of Sinai, and the Brotherhood of the Monastery uh, to clean, preserve, restore, stabilize, and to make this um, a monument that will last at least another 1,500 years. He has an incredible lecture for you, and I hope you'll all help me welcome him now. Thank you very much, Helen. It's a, a great privilege for me to be here in this beautiful uh, hall with all of you. And of course, it was a great privilege to be responsible for a, a, a conservation project of the mosaic of the Transfiguration in uh, Sinai. Um, it was, uh, this was a very intense experience because uh, the technical difficulties of the work and uh, was also very intense by the emotional point of view because uh, the importance of the monument, the location of the site, and the presence of a very flourishing and friendly community of monks. And uh, because all of this, I decided tonight, this today, uh, not to prepare a formal lecture and read it to you, but I decided to accompany you in a trip to Sinai, uh, commenting live the pictures, the video images that we have prepared uh, for you. Uh, this, uh, there are two small problems for this. The quality of the videos is, uh, is not very high, but I decided to uh, show you anyway because the videos has uh, uh, true sounds of the environment and can uh, better transmit you the feeling and the impression of the site. And the second problem, of course, is that you will have to deal with my English, so good luck, but this is, <laughs> I will do my best. I hope in your passions. So the, uh, the, the monastery of St. Catherine is uh, located in uh, Sinai Peninsula at the slopes of the mountains where Moses received the holy plates of the law. Is, uh, is in the middle of uh, the mountain that you see and uh, is about, uh, is about uh, two days, two traveling days from, uh, from Cairo. Uh, it, is, uh, it is interesting for, uh, for what concerns the Monastery of St. Catherine, how history has not changed uh, for, for centuries. The, there are diaries of Middle Age telling that the trip to, from Cairo to Suez was one day, then from Suez to St. Catherine was five days. But there is also a memory of uh, an American mission of 1959 from universities of Princeton and Michigan, where they say that they spent one day from Cairo and Suez, and then one day from Suez to St. Catherine. That is almost the same we experience every day, every time we go to the, to the monastery of St. Catherine, because we go to Cairo, we spend one night in the monastery in Cairo, then we go to Suez, and then we drive to the monastery for six hours in one of uh, the most dangerous roads you can see. 
and believe me, uh, saying this uh, as being Roman, uh, dangerous road means really dangerous. <laughs> anyway, when you get into the monastery, uh, the story is, uh, it's really, is really different. It's totally another planet. The monastery was built in the mid-5th century at behest of Emperor Justinian on the place uh, revered as the size where uh, uh, Moses spoke to God in front of the burning bush, and where in uh, the fourth century a small church was built at behest of Saint, of Saint Helena. Uh, you will see some uh, uh, old drawings that I used for this presentation. They are made by Roberts in uh, 18th centuries, and I use these drawings because uh, it is uh, incredible how things have not changed. We can recognize any single place through the drawings uh, today in the same way. Uh, the, there were many witnesses of the, of the monastery and of the site during history, and probably the oldest one is uh, Egeria. She was uh, a Roman noble woman that in the year 383, she visited the place and she left a diary. Uh, you understood well, 383. And uh, I will read uh, the words of Egeria. And uh, she say that there is a priest. Uh, she said that there is in that place a church with a priest. We therefore spend the night and then early in the morning on Sunday Along with the priests and the monks in the area, we began the ascents of the mountains. The fourth hour, we reached the summit of the holy mountain of God, the Sinai, where the law was given. If you do the same trip today, you will recognize exactly the same places that Nigeria saw 15 centuries before. Monastic life in uh, the monastery continued uninterrupted for uh, 15 centuries. Thanks to the presence of the monks, the old structures and a great quantity of uh, works of art serve and documents have survived to us. This is part of the activity of the monastery. The monastery produced the bread once a week. I'm sorry I cannot transmit you the good smell of the fresh bread. This will be for the next conference. And uh, this uh, tells a lot about uh, the interaction of the monastery and the Bedouin, uh, the Muslim Bedouins of the region. Uh, there was an old tradition that once a week the monastery give bread to the, to the Bedouins, but really the monastery do, uh, does um, much more than giving bread because they give work to the Bedouins. So the relations between uh, the Muslim Bedouins and the monastery have been always very, very close and very good. Uh, it's, not, it's not a case that the monastery one, is one of the few places that have never been attacked and violated in history. So you can imagine the monastery in the 15th century has collected documents, icons, and works of art, and has never been violated or robbed. And this is thanks to the good relations with the outside surrounding worlds. Uh, for example, the last, the last demonstration of these good relations is from since uh, a couple of months ago, when the revolution in Cairo happened, I found the bishop asking how was going things, and he said they are going very well. Soldiers and Egyptian soldiers and police uh, went away; they left, and the Bedouins entered the monastery to defend it, and we are very glad. So this is uh, again the history that doesn't change. 
Inside uh, the walls surrounding the monastery is the church. The church was built by Stephen of Isla, actual uh, Akaba, in the mid sixth century. And uh, the spiritual life of the Greek Orthodox community is centered here. About uh, 3,000 visitors enter the monastery every day in the, three, in the three hours that the monastery is open. So you can imagine you have uh, three hours packed of pilgrim and visitors, and then you have a paradise of silence and quiet and quietness. In front of the church rises a minaret, and this is the demonstration of good relations between uh, Christians and Muslims. Inside the church, you can uh, admire many original uh, decorations, and uh, amongst them, you can admire the mosaic of the Transfiguration, that is one of the major works of, uh, Byz of early Byzantine art. This is a work of extraordinary complexity, given the theological message it conveys, the scenes described, and its technical and stylistic implementation. Christ is enclosed in a mandorla formed of strips of different shades of blue. The face is surrounded by a golden halo with a cross and looks toward the faithful in the center of the church. A divine light radiates from Christ, represented by eight rays of gold and silver mosaic tiles. It strikes the prophets Elijah and Moses and the apostles John, James, and Peter. The scene is surrounded by medallions depicting boosts of prophets and apostles. A dedicatory inscription runs above the lower medallion. The triumphal arch carries the biblical narrative of Moses before the burning bush and the delivery of the Ten Commandments. Throughout history, the mosaic, the, the monastery suffered, the monastery and the mosaic suffered earthquakes, floods, and uh, rainstorms and windstorms, and uh, was uh, the focal point of uh, a liturgy that used uh, candles and uh, incense, producing a lot of smoke. Uh, so a veil of soot slowly obscured the surfaces of the mosaic. The action of the earthquakes was uh, to detach part of the mosaic from the wall. What you can see here in red is the actual surface that we found totally detached from the wall when we arrived there. Uh, we I forget to say that we arrived there in the year 2000 because uh, the Getty Conservation Institute asked us to go and check the state of conservation of the mosaic. Um, at the beginning we were, uh, well, we are a, a very small organization, so we don't like to run two major projects at the same time. So I say that that was very, that was not the moment for us because we were just uh, uh, opening a project on the submerged Roman town of Zugma in Turkey and uh, that we would have not the time to go and uh, take care of this monument. And uh, by they insisted, so we found a mediation that we were going there for a couple of weeks just to check the state of conservation of the mosaic. So in the year 2000, I went there and at the end, we stayed almost five years. <laughs> uh, when, when we arrived there, we found uh, the, monk, the monks prepared a, a very slim and high scaffold that allowed us to go up and reach the surfaces of mosaic. And I remember very well that I went up this area here of Moses, and uh, exactly the moment I touched the mosaic, 
At the beginning, I could not understand if it was the mosaic moving or the scaffolding moving. It was so detached from the wall. It was like a, like a courting, like textile, just uh, gently uh, applied on, on the wall. So it, it was really scary situation. And especially this area here, here we are right in the middle of the apse. So you, you can imagine how it is an apse. And right around uh, near the face of Christ, the mosaic was uh, uh, on the opposite shape. So it was absolutely ready to fall. And when I, I spoke with my, with my staff describing the problem, and I said, listen, this is really a mad work because it's, uh, it's unthinkable what we can do to, to, sell, to save the situation. And they relaxed me very much that they say, listen, someone has to do that. So why not, why not us? So we decided to, uh, to go to, to in deep the study and the planning and to go with this work. This is the area of the face of the Christ. It's very difficult to show you the, the, the problem in a picture, but uh, we will see later. What, what you see here in red is uh, the original uh, tiles that we found lost when we arrived there. At the end of the work, it came out that 20,000 original tessere were lost. And this is what you see in red. In 1847, a Russian monk, Samuel, restored the mosaic of the transfiguration. This means that the deterioration problem was uh, so old that the, the monk decided, well, not, he, he didn't decide it. The story is that he was uh, in Russia, he was a mosaicist, and he was asked to go to St. Catherine to restore the mosaic. And in fact, he was much more expert than us because by himself he spent only two years, <laughs> when us, in 15 people, we spent five years. So he was a very good restorer, Samuel. He filled any single hole of the mosaic with a gypsum painted as a faux mosaic. And uh, he applied uh, many iron pins and he painted uh, the missing area as it was mosaic. He was incredibly modern in his uh, attitude. And in fact, what he did for sure saved the mosaic. What you see here in red is the work of Samuel. You can see how intense his intervention has been. So at the, in, in reality, what you don't see, what you, you were not used to see from the floor of the church is that the mosaic of this transfiguration that was believed to be underpresented mosaic, in reality was a mosaic plus the reconstruction of uh, Father Samuel that of course has been uh, in gypsum and color did not reflect the light as the original tessera. But because everything was covered by dust and soot, at that time you could not realize that. These are other examples of, of, of the work of Samuel. This person here is uh, Ernst Hawkins. He was uh, a, a British restorer that was asked by Michigan and Princeton universities to go and, uh, and restore, and not restore exactly, but to check the state of the mosaic in 1955. It was a mission led by Kurt Weizmann, and, uh, and they went there. You can notice how young he was, but at that time uh, he had already restored Karie Jami and Hagia Sophia in uh, Istanbul. So really he was a very expert man. And please notice also this uh, father here. We will meet him again later on. So the, the American mission simply inserted some uh, extra metal pins and uh, 
they fix few areas, but then they had uh, no uh, scaffolding, no proper scaffolding, no light, and especially no, food, no foods. So after three months, they had to give up and they went back to the United States. In the year 2000, thanks to uh, funds allocated by the Emir of Qatar, we started the work. So the, the, the Holy Brotherhood of the Monastery of St. Catherine decided to give us the responsibility for this work. So we came there and, uh, and all the work uh, lasted five years. Uh, it consisted in uh, documentation of the mosaic, consolidation, cleaning, and treatment of gaps. Uh, as, uh, as we saw before, we, the first thing we did with the help of the fathers, we built up a scaffolding that allowed us to work in safe condition, in a comfortable condition for so long time. In order not to interfere with the life of the church, we place on the outside face, on the face of the scaffolding looking in the church, a one-to-one -one scale photograph of the mosaic so that the life of the church could continue without interference. It is uh, interesting that when I presented the project to the, to the bishop uh, at the very end, and they accepted, at the very end, they inform me of a small details. And they say that because the mosaic is in the Santa Santorum, obviously women were not allowed to be there. And that was a terrible news for me because 90% of my team is made of women. So uh, we started a long discussion um, with, uh, with the fathers and at the end, we came out with a solution that was, was approved. The solution was to build up a scaffold that was totally sealed from the church. We built an entrance, not from the church, but from a window of the, of the roof of the church, so that women, in fact, were not into the Santa Santorum, but they were above the Santa Santorum, and they have been accepted, and we could start the work. And another story is related to this picture. Uh, we, we put, as you know, the fathers pray five, time, five times a day, and the longest prayer is during the night. So we started to put the picture one to one uh, in the morning, and we ended in the evening, right before the night service. Uh, the day after, uh, one very old monk uh, came to me, he was very happy, and he started to thank me because uh, we finished the work so fast that everything was already finished and the, and the scaffolding dismantled. Everything was uh, implemented during our intervention was uh, recorded on computer, directly on the scaffolding, uh, using photographs in one-to-one -one scale, so that all information were immediately recorded and transferred to the library of the monastery. This is another example of the documentation we did. What you see in uh, blue, in light blue, is uh, the result of our work of consolidation. So all, you see, all the surfaces you see in light blue in reality are the surfaces that now are uh, freshly reconsolidated. And what you see in a darker uh, blue are the areas that we will uh, check and control during the future maintenance. So it's what we call a risky area of uh, future detachment. So in the future, uh, whoever will implement the maintenance of the, of the mosaic of the transfiguration already know where to go and check and which kind of problems he, has, he will have to face. 
An intervention like this allowed us, the, gave us the possibility to study the original techniques of uh, manufacturing uh, the mosaic, such as, for example, the study of the giornate. The giornate, you can see here, the giornate is uh, the working time the mosaicists have used to, uh, to do the, the mosaic. Uh, as you know, the mosaic is, uh, is applied on a structure made of granite blocks. On the structure, they applied a plaster, a lime-based plaster. Then on the plaster, they design uh, the shape and the figures. And then when the plaster is still wet, they apply the tessere, the, 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 the glass cubes. This means that there is a certain surface that they can cover with plaster and not more before the, the plaster dry. Because if they apply more plaster than what they can cover with tessere, then the plaster dries and they cannot apply the tessere anymore. So the quantity of uh, the, the surface that they could work on every day is called giornate. Giornate in Italian means, uh, uh, de, giorno means day. So giornate is uh, the technical terms that has been used to call uh, the daily working time. And this is a, a, a very interesting information for us because uh, gave us information on the progress of uh, the mosaic manufacturing. Here you can, uh, you can see one of these giornate. And this is the plate that show the giornate that we, can, uh, we could uh, identify on the surfaces. So this is not the drawing of all the working day. This is the drawing of the working day that we have been able to recognize on the surfaces. And this tells us a lot. For example, if they started from the top, or from the bottom, and uh, if they were divided in team or, they, or if they were working only one team. And uh, reading this plate, we learn a lot on the mosaic. Uh, such, for example, the fact that we know that they started from the top and they went d uh, going down, and not the opposite as we might have thought. This is another example of the giornate. Again, you see here, you can notice that the mortar applied to implement this section was fresh when this section was already done. And that's why this mortar is overlapping this section here. Another interesting surprise that we got in studying this mosaic is the high presence of colors in between the tessere. And uh, we discovered that, in fact, all uh, the surface of the mosaic was uh, painted before applying the tessere. You can see here, for example, this is black, this is red, this is green, this is black again. And uh, there is also yellow, and, 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 and all these colors mix to them to produce different gradations. The reason for this is, uh, uh, for example, here you can, you can see some yellow also here. And this is the map of the color of uh, the plaster of the mosaic before the application of the tessere. The reason for, for doing this, it's, uh, the reasons are at least three. The first one is uh, to design the composition and the drawings of the mosaic uh, before implementing it to guide the mosaicist in the application of the cubes. The second one is uh, that the, uh, the, the, the color comes out through the tessere when you look at it. 
And the third reason is that because some of the tesseres are transparent, the colors give uh, an extra background to the mosaic. So in reality, the results, the aesthetical result of the mosaic of the transfiguration is not only given by the colors of the tessere, but is also given by the colors applied in the preparation, on the preparation layers of the tessere themselves. The palette of uh, this mosaic, uh, of the colors of this mosaic, is extremely rich. We found uh, uh, more than 35 different colors that, for a mosaic of this time, is really a huge number. It gives you uh, the idea of uh, how rich was uh, this project at that age. Uh, in the arch, you can notice that the, gold, the gilt tessere are not flat, but are tilt, tilted 45 degrees. And this was to make the natural and the artificial light coming from the windows and from the candles to be more reflected uh, toward the direction of the faithful in the church. You can see this way the light is reflected directly in direction of uh, uh, the faithful. <laughs> the condition of the mosaic was, uh, were so bad that uh, we, before touching it, we decided to build uh, a structure uh, hunkered directly to the walls of the, of the church so not in contact with the scaffolding because the scaffolding can, can vibrate. And uh, in order to put uh, props to keep the mosaic in place before uh, any treatments, we were absolutely scared that everything could fall down the first hole that we were going to produce. So that's why we produce the structure that we call the spider that uh, was, le well, in fact, is still there. And uh, uh, because uh, we preferred that everything was, uh, uh, was uh, held by extra structure during our work. The work began with uh, cleaning of the dust. Uh, for this, we use in vacuum cleaners, and, uh, and, and we remove the dust. At that point, we have the first big surprise, and we discovered that a very high percentage of the tessere were not stable, but were movable, ready to fall down. So we started an extremely long process of uh, consolidation, tile by tile, by using liquid mortar made of the same compositions as the original. After this, the consolidation of the deep layers started, and this process is done by producing small holes in between the tessere with small drills, and then sucking out uh, the dust inside of the mosaic using uh, dental instruments. When all the dust inside the structure has been removed, uh, the strata are cleaned by distilled water, and then the consolidation starts, injecting hydraulic liquid mortar that is made of lime, uh, stone dust, in the same compositions as the original. As the process proceeds, props are applied to keep the surface in place until the mortar set up.
Let me specify that does not exist instrument more efficient than the hair of uh, the conservators. Uh, there are no ultrasounds, no thermovisions. They are very interesting and good instruments for, uh, for editing publications, scientific publications. But if you really want to check the solidity of a mosaic, the, right, the finger of your right hand is the best tool. And you don't have to pass customs with Egypt to bring it. <laughs> this is the area of uh, the face of the Christ, where uh, we found uh, a detachment of uh, the mosaic in the point you can see here. Well, you cannot see here, but you must believe me. <laughs> where in the point where the gravity effect is the maximum because uh, was the curve was like this, the detachment of the mosaics was six centimeters. So really no one knows, knows how the mosaic is still there. Well, the monks have their own ideas, but. <laughs> so you see that the, the shape is, is totally inverted. Uh, because of that situation, what we decided to do was uh, to consolidate all around and then before, before touching that place, that area, and then when we were safe that all the surrounding areas were solid and sound, we decided to face the real problem. Uh, I must admit that we waited three years before going and touching that area. And the first thing we did was to apply cotton gauze with synthetic resins, that's why we wear masks, in order to protect and hold a wider area than the one we were going to work on. And when this uh, uh, protection with, with cotton gauze was uh, finished, we decided to open an area 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters and open it as a cover of a book. The reason for doing this is very easy. We did not want it to do as, uh, uh, as, as a poor monk Samuel did, or as uh, the, 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 the mission from, uh, from Princeton did the way before. Uh, they went there and they did what they, the best they could do with, uh, with that comparing their times. That means uh, to consolidate the areas, but without understanding the real reason for the damage. So what we wanted to do was, uh, uh, before, before uh, consolidating it, understand why the mosaic in that place was going, uh, was so badly deteriorated, and in case, intervene on the real causes of the detachment. We had the suspect that the problem came from the granite structure of the vault, so we were afraid that there was a crack right in that area. That means that we should have, in that case, we should have opened the vault from the outside and, and implement some consolidation of the granite structure and then consolidate the mosaic. That's why we opened that section. And uh, you can see the setting bed painted in red, the original one. And, uh, we discovered that the setting bed was uh, completely decayed and fractured. Therefore, we decided to remove it uh, as, uh, as it was a uh, mosaic in order to go and investigate the state of the granite structure. And uh, we were very lucky, I must admit, because uh, we arrived exactly on a joint between two blocks and we discovered that the joints were perfectly sealed. So the problem was not a problem in the structure, but the problem was a simple infiltration of water coming from the windows above the altar. Uh, in order to be sure of what I'm saying, we used an endoscope. We inserted an endoscope into, the, into that section, and we investigate the state of the granite structure. So it was confirmed that the damage was from water coming from here. In the Middle Age, there was no glasses in the, in the windows, so the wind blow, uh, 
inside the water and the water enter right on the face of Christ. So we could uh, complete the consolidation of uh, that area and then we applied, uh, we, we closed the book back and we applied the mosaic back using the same techniques as the original. That means uh, producing a first stratum of uh, a mortar with a second stratum, a thinner stratum that was uh, of lime mortar again that was later painted with red ochre mm. like the original and then the mosaic was laid back. This is how it came out of, after the work. So centuries of candles and, and dust covered the surfaces of the mosaic with a dark uh, veil. And uh, in order to remove it, we implemented very mild and gentle processes of cleaning this consisted in an application of, uh, of uh, paper pulp uh, holding very mild uh, chemical solvents capable of diluting the greasy uh, stratum of soot. We applied the paper pulp left for 15 minutes and then removed and, and brushed the dirt away. You remember the young monk that was in the, in the picture with the Americans, <laughs> his father Eumonius, is this one, 50 years later, is still here every day on the scaffolding with us. Nothing changed in 50 years. One day I, I was sitting by him and I said, I'm very glad that you are so interested in restoration, Padre Eumonius. He looked at me surprised and I said, well, I am partially interested in restoration. The real reason I'm here is to control that you don't damage the mosaic. <laughs> Someone told me this operation here sounds a little violent. And I say, so, but that's, that's the truth. When the mosaic is solid, because the consolidation is effective, you can use this brush without, without risks. Not before, of course. Harmonious, always there. Once the cleaning was finished, we started to remove uh, the feelings of uh, Padre Samuel. And this because uh, uh, they were, uh, at the moment, uh, they were uh, uh, not effective anymore, and uh, they were interfering with the final impression of the mosaic. And in some places, they were covering the original tessere, like this one, that I wonder why he decided to cover with a stucco. And being, being gypsum and cement, the stucco was not very stable. So all these fillings have been removed together with the metal pins that he applied. Look at there at the, at the side of the mosaic, how many tessera were covered with the stucco. The metal pin being iron might have damaged the mosaic in the future. 
So because the mosaic now is consolidated, there was no reason anymore to keep them. So with the long work of, with chisels, we removed the pins that Samuel applied in 1847. We left only one, just as a memory of a very well done work of the last century. The result of the cleaning and the removal of the stucco in of Samuel was uh, the uh, existence of thousands of small holes that were interfering with the final aesthetic of uh, the mosaic. Uh, so the uh, filling of the gaps started and uh, we decided to use uh, the techniques very similar of the original, again with lime-based mortar, and then applying uh, new tessere of, made of glass in Venice, produced with the same techniques as the original. And this is a very interesting, uh, this is a key point of this intervention, because as you probably know, uh, according to the theory of restoration, everything you do has to be fully recognizable. Otherwise, you take the risk of uh, producing a fails. Uh, here in St. Catherine, we realized that thanks to the documentation, the digital documentation that today is available, uh, if we are going to record any single tessera that we applied, in reality, we don't make a fake because we leave documentation and notice of what we are doing. In short terms, after the intervention, you will be able to say what is new and what is old. And even more, we had three options for filling this lacuna. The first one was acting like Samuel using uh, plaster and paint it with uh, watercolors. Second, uh, to leave the gaps open. Third, to use uh, the tiles. Uh, because St. Catherine, because the place is so hidden away and uh, we, we could not expect another conservation intervention in the next 50 years. And so everything we did, uh, we, we were going to do should have been uh, uh, long lasting in time. And uh, in this term, only the materials similar to the original were capable to give these guarantees uh, of long lasting in time. The second aspect is that the mosaic is, uh, is a glass, so as a very important uh, action in reflecting light and only the, only the, the, the glass tessera are capable of reflecting the light as the original. The third point is that uh, the mosaic of this transfiguration is not a work of art, is not a piece of archeology span because uh, it is located in a place that is life, that never died. So is not a piece, again, is not a piece of art, is uh, an instrument of prayer for the monks of the monastery. So the opinion of the monks that are the real owner of uh, the real owner and the real users of the monument was crucial to us. And the willing, the strong willing of the fathers was that they were going to use uh, the tessere. That's why we agreed to go to these methods. And uh, but again with the certainness that we were not producing a phase. When I say this, is because uh, I speak, when I speak uh, of uh, documentation and when I speak of a uh, high resolution uh, documentation, I speak uh, of this kind of picture that gives us the possibility to record any single tessera. So for us, uh, any single piece of stone or glass as a coordinate and as a name, a surname, so we know if they are original or not, what they are, and uh, what happened in their place. I don't pretend that you believe, you trust me. I will show you now some example of this kind of documentation. Uh, for example, this is uh, 
this is the plate recording, reporting the new tesseras that we applied. So this is new, this is new, this is new, this is new, this is new. There are many, but this, doing this way, you have to, the possibility to go there and detect what is new and what is original. We could do this because we had available uh, photograph at high resolution that allowed us uh, a one-to-one -one scale. This is the kind uh, of photographs that we have been using to record uh, what we did. And uh, this scale, one-to-one, -one, has been applied to all over the mosaic. And now all this is, avail is available on computer and uh, will be very soon available on the web so that anyone we will be able to have access to the documentation and check what has been done or not. Again, the plate, and this is the full-scale plate of uh, the new tessera. In fact, we replaced 2,000 tessera on a total of uh, 500,000 component in the mosaic that correspond to 4% of uh, the mosaic of the transfiguration. Here I can give you an example of, uh, of this place, how it works, the documentation. This is uh, Moses facing the burning bush before the intervention. This is the plate of the different uh, working days, is the plate of the giornate. You see, first they did this, then they did this, then I don't know why they did this. This is the plate of the detached areas before our arrival. This is the plate of the color of the background. This is the plate showing the different materials they have been used to, to make the mosaic. This is our, consolid our consolidations. This is the work of Samuel. And this is our feeling of the lacuna. And this is after the work. So this kind of uh, uh, approach and this kind of photograph available gave us the possibility to study several details of the work and techniques, as, you, as I said before. You can see here again a working day, the line of a working day. You can see how it's recognizable. And you can also see here, for example, this is the working day. First they did this, and then they did this. But when they did this, they, had, they went out of this kind of tessere, or maybe they didn't found, and they use different colors of tessera to finish the same flower. This is a pretty interesting. If you notice, there is a squared area here. We have been wondering the reason for this many for a long time. And probably the reason for this is that this one was one of the holes left open to insert the scaffold that they used to work on the mosaic. This kind of structure that uh, was uh, requiring holes to make the wood inside. And then when the work was finished, they dismantled the scaffolding and they sealed the, the squared hole. Another interesting characteristic is this one. You can see the shape of the tessera is square, except this kind of tessera that are made of glass. And uh, uh, these are very long tessere that are used to design the shape of hands and feet. Uh, you can see here that you see there is some gold on this. So the reason for this gold is that these tessere have been cut by, from the original piastra of the tessere. What you see here, uh, these are modern material, but the technology is the same. This is how we buy the tesser in Venice. They come in slabs, uh, the color uh, mosaic, and uh, the, the, the gold is uh, in, this, uh, in this shape. 
then from these shapes we cut with different tools and we arrive to the final tessere. So what they did at that time is they cut this area here per square section a small tessera and then they used the surrounding area to, uh, to do the shape of feet and hands or to do the cornish. And this gives us a, a, an extremely important information that is that the mosaic was done on place by using new tessere made there on purpose for that mosaic. That means that they did not reuse uh, tessere coming from another place as it happened later on on the centuries. So this is the, demo the demonstration that probably they carried the piastras and then they cut the piastras this way. This is a, a, a low relief from Ostia and you can see the mosaicis working exactly the same way we do today. These are bringing pieces of stone or, or, or glass and the other one they are cutting using these materials. So what you saw there in the mosaic was this section here. Another example is on the hand of Moses. You can see here traces of gold. So the work is finished. Uh, I would like to use, uh, to, to read a few words from the gospel uh, according to Matthew. Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up a high mountain. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his garment became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. He was still speaking when a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I well pleased. Listen to him. The long and complex conservation program has ended. Thanks to the steady stewardship of the monks, to the perfect original techniques used, to the financial contribution of an emir of an Islamic country and five years of passion efforts by the conservators, the mosaic of the transfiguration can shine forth his message of faith and prayer once more. Let me conclude with a, a personal comment on this. I think that the, 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 the main experience we got from this uh, work is that uh, we realized that the, the monastic community of St. Catherine embody a spirit of tolerance, uh, that uh, tolerance between uh, religions and cultures that accompanied this place in the last 15 centuries. And uh, this spirit of tolerance between uh, cultures and religions, I think that is a principle today extremely actual and extremely uh, necessary to everybody, uh, to all of us. Thank you very much.